an appeal in the matter of the Queen on the application of Antique Cultural Treasures Limited and the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. I appear with Mr Christian for the appellants, Sir James Eady uh, and Mr Cashman are for the respondents. Um, housekeeping first, there is one further authority on my Lord's desk that should go at the back of Authorities Bundle 5. It's the Commission guidelines on the application of the precautionary principle, which I'll come to in due course. Uh, the wider uh, issue that arises is of timekeeping, and as you know, Sir James is in some difficulty and he wanted to address you in relation to that. Well, I'm sorry, the fault is entirely mine. I've got a um, grand chamber hearing in Strasbourg yes. on Wednesday morning starting at nine. The difficulty that faces anyone going from the UK nowadays is that there are no direct flights that go to Strasbourg and Basel, which is the nearest, tends to get fog bound. So the only safe way of going there is by Eurostar. If I get on the 2.20 tomorrow out of King's Cross, I get there at about 10 o'clock at night. Yes. And so what we were wondering was whether or not, and I've spoken to my other friend about this, if the court was prepared to sit for, say, half an hour later this afternoon and start half an hour earlier tomorrow, I could then leave Mr Cashman with your permission whilst my learning friend replies after lunch tomorrow. But I will be done by about one o'clock or very shortly thereafter. Well, I don't think today is not going to be possible because we're swearing in the Attorney General today. Uh, so in fact, we, I have, we have to rise at four. I'm sorry to compound the problem for you. We have to rise at four. But we can sit, as I, I, I certainly speak for myself, we have discussed sitting at 10, but we can sit earlier. Uh, to accommodate you as much so as early as, as you want. We can start tomorrow. Well, maybe the answer is to take a rain check at the end of the day and see where Mr Delanair has got to. I mean, I think with I think I will probably need something like two hours or a bit under. Yeah. So well, if he's if done he, by he 11 tomorrow... If nine, we'll sit at nine. I mean, whatever, whatever is necessary, we'll, we'll, very, we'll very make sure that uh, we'll, we'll be able to complete your submissions. Yes. Now, as the court knows, th this case is about whether or not it's lawful to ban the trade in antiques made many, many years ago, in whole or in part from elephant ivory. Even where there's no dispute about the antique age of the ivory in question, and even where the item in question is no mere trinket, but rather an item with a high, distinct and significant artistic, cultural or historical value that go way, goes way beyond, in money terms, the base value of its ivory contents. Now, my clients, as we made clear uh, below, fully support the intensified efforts to take all practical and proportionate steps to tackle the current poaching of elephants and to knock out the economic incentives and markets that drive uh, such poaching. And the references, uh, should they be helpful, are set out in footnote one to our judicial review grounds, which is core eight, uh, page one four one. The simple truth is that no antique dealer or collector of antique ivory in this country wants to see elephants killed today. But the problems with the illegal trade in fresh ivory and with poaching to supply it are not caused by the United Kingdom antiques market. The claimants and those they represent are people who are interested in, dedicated to, Beautiful and rare antique items that are valued for their artistry, their craftsmanship, and their historical or cultural resonance. They're antique lovers. They are not people who love ivory per se, simply because it's ivory. And the evidence is that so far as those people exist, they exist in other parts of the world, predominantly Asia. Here, ivory, fresh ivory, is repugnant to most, if not all people, including the claimants. But the sad fact is that elephants were once far, far more common than they are today. Indeed, they were ubiquitous in large parts of Africa, and ivory was an exceedingly common raw material for all kinds of craft and artistic endeavours, much as now rare hardwoods are, or oceanic ivory from walruses, or whale bones. It was a common commodity in the 18th century and 19th century. And uh, for that reason, it was part of the craft and cultural legacy of this country. Indeed, evidence submitted by Traffic, the, the highly reputed NGO, suggested that something in the order of 30,000 tonnes from 1.1 million uh, elephants were imported to the United Kingdom before World War I. The reference for that is D2 
48692. And traffic, uh, helpfully explain at D250, page 710, the, the full history of the use of ivory in this country, rather as the plastic of its day. <coughs> so ivory was used from everything, from high crafts through to utilitarian tools like magnifying glasses, surgical tools, cutlery, uh, etc. I'm going to be using the term antique ivory, which is a legislative term of art from the EU legislation. It means items that were fully worked, fully made before 1947, and for a large part, they're very much older than that. And my clients say that this is a country that appreciates beautiful things and its history, even if, and not because, such things are made of ivory. There is no modern culture of appreciating ivory per se here, and the judge rightly found uh, in the judgment at paragraph 175 that there was little or no appetite uh, in this country for ivory other than of antiquity. But what there can be no doubt as to is that it is the intention and uh, the effect of Section 1 of the Act that along with the many utilitarian, quotidian or insignificant items that are made of ivory, very many antique uh, items of very considerable value, very considerable artistic or cultural or historical merit and resonance will be rendered valueless. They'll be practically incapable of sale, other than perhaps, and this is speculation, at far sale prices to museums, and they're unlikely to be significant buyers. And there were examples of the items affected at uh, D4, tabs 100 to 115. And so it will be a consequence of the act and the deliberate stripping of value from these items and of its vanishingly narrow relevant exemptions that over time many of these very beautiful and valuable items will be lost. They'll be destroyed, they'll be thrown away, they will cease to have uh, value to those holding them commercially, they will cease to have value uh, as such, to uh, people holding them as mere possessions. And the likelihood over time is they'll be damaged, thrown away upon succession or inheritance or matters of that kind, because it's simply impossible to put the items in the hands of people who value or appreciate them. Now, it's worth emphasising at the outset, and, and this is important, that there is no evidence, no evidence whatsoever of any recent trade in the United Kingdom in fresh ivory. What very limited problems there have been identified by anecdotal evidence is confined to pre-convention ivory. That is ivory harvested or hunted before 1976, but after 1947. And even that problem in the UK has been confined to those operating on the margins of the business in internet trading and the like, well away from the expert and reputable end of the trade represented by my clients. And again, it's worth emphasising, there is no evidence whatsoever of any trade in fake antiques in the United Kingdom made from fresh ivory. Right. Uh, a lot of this is very, it's very interesting. There, but I, I'd like to try and concentrate what the function of this court is, which is uh, it's a, to hear a review uh, of, the, uh, of the case, not to conduct a rehearing on every point. And I think we are quite keen to see what it is exactly you say are the flaws in the judgment. Yes, my lord. Well, the government's case, when it, the reason I emphasise that there's no current trade is because the critical feature of this case is it becomes essentially about two things comes about export and the dangers of export and whether or not the measure in question is a proportionate response to the problems posed by the export market. And secondly, it becomes uh, a case about the strength of the government's case on the topic of symbolism, solidarity with international partners, underpinning uh, 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 and encouraging strict responses in other jurisdictions. Those are the two pivots on which this case turns. And the legal pivot on which this case turns is the judge's deferential approach, notwithstanding the paucity of evidence of problems, even in relation to export. 
his use of the precautionary principle, which was not cited in any of the materials, it wasn't part and parcel of the analysis leading to the act, it wasn't part of the government's case, it wasn't argued before the judge, and it's inapplicable on the authorities when they're properly understood. Because when we look at it uh, closely, what we have is a situation where the precautionary principle is being applied in the absence of the kind of evidence it's needed for application, in the absence of the conscious application of the principle by the relevant decision maker. And that's an important part, and it may be a material difference between EU law and ECHR law. There is effectively a procedural dimension to the precautionary principle. You have to consciously invoke it. Is, is his use of the precautionary principle really distinct from his conclusion that there was a broad political margin of appreciation? I rather got the, it was a sort of a phrase he used, but it was sort of wrapped up in his in his conclusion that there was a broad margin to be attributed to the government because of what you described as the symbolism, the, but the, the encouraging others, the leadership. I wasn't certain I saw a great distinction between the two. Well, with respect, when one looks at the judgment, in particular paragraph 153, you see how what's called method two, the export issue, yeah. becomes the hook for the application of the precautionary principle, which then in turn becomes the hook for what the judge calls the softer uh, approach to investigation of these issues. And what we have, and in my submission, what is actually unparalleled, is the application of precautionary principle reasoning not to science, not to econometrics, not to matters capable of some degree of qualitative and quantitative investigation, but rather to questions of political judgment. It becomes a test in which effectively you say, it's enough that the legislature thinks that there's some risk. It doesn't matter how large the risk is. It doesn't matter how the harm is quantified. It doesn't matter whether or not the legislature has investigated the cost. It's, once you conclude that there is some conjectural risk, that is enough to, to find the decision to be proportionate under a precautionary principle. And if that is the test, then the precautionary principle and the proportionality principle have no meaningful substance as a criterion for review. Because that test will always be met. Unless you're in the extraordinary circumstance of a legislature acting in bad faith, you're always going to say, I acted because I thought in good faith that there might be some risk. Who knows how things may pan out on the international plane. Uh, this is all done on a precautionary basis, and I don't need to investigate the harm caused their both. Just to understand that, are you saying the precautionary <coughs> principle is limited to certain types of evidence? No, I'm not, I'm not going so far as to say categorically it's limited to a, a scientific case that can be proved by reference to scientific studies. The type of evidence that may feed into the precautionary principle will vary. But what is striking about this case is that there simply was no material investigation into what became the operative hook for all of this, which is the impact of exported ivory antiques in the foreign markets where legal ivory items persist alongside illegal ivory items. That's really the key area of inquiry. And the government has done simply no investigation in that area. That's the evidential difficulty they face. And that's why this case is, in many ways, back to front. Because one of the unusual features of this case is that we say the judge made just about every material factual finding, narrow factual finding, in our favour. It's at the inferential level from the facts and the application of principles of deference and the application of the principle of proportionality that he decided the case against us. That's why we say this case turns on some points of law. It's why my learned friend Sir James has advanced a fairly detailed factual respondent's notice that seeks to reopen the judge's factual findings in relation to methods one and two. And that is um, a, an unusual state of affairs. <coughs> now, um, my submissions... Are, I, so you're I, just relying upon the facts as found? Yes, with one or two... Um, minor exceptions, absolutely. I'll flag those fairly when I get to them, my lord. So uh, we see the topics to be these. Topic one, intensity of review. Uh, and there is an issue here about the effect of doubling up an interference with uh, free movement of goods with an interference with uh, uh, property rights. 
Topic two is the precautionary principle, what it requires, what quality of evidence, how and when. Topic three is the short topic uh, that I know my Lord Lord Justice Green knows to be a hardy perennial, which is deference to Parliament, the question left open by Lumsden in the Supreme Court. Topic four is our answer to my learned friend's factual arguments in his respondent's notice. Topic five I tend to take very quickly by reference to the skeleton argument is arbitrariness by reference to the exemptions in the Act. Topic uh, six, uh, a very important one, and one that resolves ultimately to the question of why can't the measure proceed more proportionally by simple export ban, is the question of equally effective measures. And topic seven is proportionality strict to sensu, where uh, the focus is on compensation. And the reason that the focus on compensation arises is because the starkness of my learned friend's case, which you can see in the skeleton argument, <coughs> at paragraph 42.1, it's worth just flagging this point up right at the outset. <coughs> Because the answer to our case of if the problem is in relation to export and export alone therefore close the potential to export but permit the continued operation of a purely domestic market, the answer to that is essentially that so important is leadership in the field, so important is providing solidarity and encouragement to other states, that even if the domestic market is being entirely lawfully conducted and even if it constitutes no risk of fresh poaching today, it must be closed in order to demonstrate the seriousness with which the United Kingdom views the issue. In other words, it's a symbolic gesture that will in of itself achieve nothing other than to encourage others to act. That's the nub of what's at 41 page 60. And if that's right, that has profound ramifications for the topic of proportionality stricto sensu and for the topic of compensation and the significance of an absence of compensation scheme. Because what could be less in accordance with the fair balance that the convention requires than requiring individuals and businesses to accept very significant losses from activities that are unproblematic in and of themselves in order to encourage others to act properly. Compare and contrast the handguns ban after the Dunblane massacre where all of the handguns owners and all of the businesses selling handguns much more directly implicated in the problem in the hand, mass shootings, were compensated under the scheme introduced by the Act. Was that a true ban? Yes, sense, it was. In the sense that use and <coughs> possession were made criminal. Yes, my lord. But of course, possession of an artefact that can't be sold is valueless to a business. And it's also valueless to somebody who inherits something that previously had value that they don't want and that otherwise they would dispose of. And I would suggest that the reason why possession has been retained, musician exemptions aside, is principally to avoid the pitfalls of the Article 1, Protocol 1, debt privation, compensation, debt, you know, prima facie obligation. Well, why, should, why should we make that inference? Well, that, that's tantamount to alleging bad things. No, it's not tantamount to that, my Lord. It's tantamount to saying that the, the, res, the rights left are of little residual value, and they have been emphasised in order to get one out of uh, the ordinary approach, which is that a ban on an item of this kind would trigger an obligation of compensation. And so what we say is left is really a husk of the rights. We've relied upon the UCAFPO CAFPO case to say alienability is a cardinal, if not the cardinal feature of a property right. And once you take that away, particularly vis-a-vis -a, -vis a business or particularly vis-a-vis -vis an individual who's holding property for some mixed underlying commercial intent, the witness statements suggest that a number of people hold uh, items for their pension fund or with a view to sale at old age or matters of that kind. Once you take away value, you've effectively stripped 
strip them of the, of the essence of the property rights. So <laughs> those are the topics I plan to cover. You've got seven topics altogether. Seven topics, three provisional ones to get through. First of all, let me say something first about the claimants. Um, I just ask, have, have you, I don't know if you've discussed with Sir James, uh, splitting the time, you've got a day and a half. Yes. Have you discussed how you were We have discussed it, and uh, as he indicated, I, I, I indicated that were we to have sat to quarter to five, I'd be finished by 11. So one's going to have to do some consequential uh, amendments. Sir James has asked for two hours, and we need to work out how to get him those two hours. I don't know if that was, we have read a lot. We are pretty familiar with the facts, the witness statements, the reports, and so on. I'm grateful, my lord. Um, have you have you um, uh, picked through, if it's not too impertinent to question, um, the EU and um, domestic legislation so that it would be a, an unnecessary exercise for me to take you through that, or would it be helpful to have a whistle-stop tour of some of the, the key features? I, th I think a whistle-stop tour would be wise. I'm grateful. <laughs> so um, the first topic I was going to address was the uh, claimants, and in the light of that indication I'll do so very briefly. Uh, the claimant is an SPV, we, we make no bones about that. The directors are dealers and collectors in the antique uh, 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 ivory, and they're supported by witness statements from a, a representative range of dealers and collectors affected uh, by the band. And many of the individuals who've given witness statements are world experts in their particular fields. Uh, Rosemary Bandini, for instance, is a, a renowned expert in relation to Netskis. <coughs> Collectors of fans, they're collectors of walking sticks, uh, businesses where the businesses are also collectors in their private capacities. And throughout the litigation, we focused on net skis as a useful test category. Why? Because there's no problem of provenance. These are often miniature works of art with a clear provenance, sales records to demonstrate their age. The value of them, as the judge found, far exceeds the base value of the ivory in question. <coughs> and the uh, impact of the act in relation to these items, which the evidence shows to be appreciated for their artistic value, just like musical instruments are appreciated for their value as instruments, it is unquestionable. Uh, and indeed, the judge accepted that Netskis may be made out of alternative materials, woods, uh, bones, uh, etc. And the evidence displays a clear collector's dilemma about whether or not to keep the collection here enjoy it because of the personal pleasure it gives, or whether to sell it at buy or sell prices or seek to move it abroad. <coughs> and it also demonstrates the, the chilling effect that the legislation has already had in terms of loss of value. So that's the claims. The legal context, let me show you very briefly the key provisions. Uh, the first thing is um, the principal regulation in Authority Bundle 2, tab 20. We put in the original version, which has the original recitals, before the consolidated version of the regulation. The consolidated version starts about a third of the way through this clip. It starts with the familiar M references indicating all the times that the legislation has been amended. The relevant provisions uh, in the principal regulation are, start with Article 5 that deal with export or re-export from the community. This, of course, has to be read with Article 2W, uh, a few pages earlier, that defines the term work specimens that were acquired more than 50 years ago. That's on page 4 of the consolidated version. Article 5 is on page 8. <coughs> and the position is that export requires a permit... And the relevant conditions have to be satisfied are set out in Article 5.2a to d. And the ones of pre present relevance are 2a and uh, 2b and d. And 2a uh, looks like a fail straight away in relation to ivory, but it's then qualified by Article 5.6, which provides that the conditions in 2a shall not apply one, to worked specimens, i.e. more than 50 years old, antique ivory, or two, uh, 
Roman II on page 10 can be summarised as pre-convention ivory. So you can get an export permit for pre-convention ivory and for uh, uh, antique ivory. Then <coughs> you have to provide documentary evidence proving the age of the item in question, that's B. And D, this is the key thing upon which many of the policies that operate in the area are built. The management of authority of the member state has to be satisfied following consultation with the appropriate scientific authority that there are no other factors relating to the conservation of the species which militate against the issuance of the export licence. And it's 5.2d, for instance, that has been used to introduce the, 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 the ban by way of policy upon the export of all raw ivory and upon the export of rhino horns. Those are both policies made under 5.2d. Those are the export provisions. <coughs> the provisions dealing with internal uh, trade are in Article 8. And this operates on a scheme of prohibition in relation to purchase, sale, acquisition for commercial purposes, display, etc. unless exempted. There are then optional exemptions in 8.3 of which the relevant one is H3B. This is all framed permissively, may be granted, etc. And then there's provision for a scheme of rigid derogations in 8.4, the general derogations. And that is what's then provided by the subsidiary regulation, which is in the next tab, the relevant general derogation provided under the powers in 8.4 is on page 19 of the implementing regulation, it's 62.3. Does it follow from the regulation the member states, in accordance with the regulation, are entitled to impose an absolute prohibition pursuant to Article 8.1? They're not obliged to grant exceptions. Subject only to principles of fettering, of discretion, yes. <clears throat> Absolutely. To what extent does the broad way in which you challenge the ban also embrace the prohibition which is contained within Article 8? Well, the, the ban hasn't been grounded in Article and I think we're agreed that Article does 8... Does not overlap with it to some degree? They run in parallel. So if, you, if you're in one of the exemptions permitted under the Act, let's say you've got de minimis quantities of ivory, or you've got a certified outstanding item, if you wanted to export it, let's say, to a foreign museum, you would still have to go through the eight, uh, Article 8 process. But you would, in those circumstances, benefit from an automatic derogation. That's how it works. So... What, what Article 8 does is effectively police that part of permitted activity that's left by the Act in the areas of the exemptions. But um, what we say is significant is that eight, um, so Article 5.2d uh, 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 provides a power to ban exports. It plainly does. That's already happened in those two documented instances in the past. So that's the EU setup. Of course, what's then happened, and this was ground one, uh, which has not been pursued, what's happened is that the United Kingdom has decided to adopt stricter measures pursuant to Article 193 of the treaty. That's at tab 19 of the bundle. And it provides the protective measures adopted pursuant to Article 192, or well, both these regulations are such measures, shall not prevent any member state from maintaining or introducing more stringent protective measures. Such measures must be compatible with the treaty. They shall be notified to the Commission. And what we know about um, those types of measures is that they must pass the test identified by the CJEU in the Triton case. And this is relevant for formulating how we get into proportionality. That's in Authorities Bundle 3, tab 35. Now, Triton was a case about scarlet macaws, CITES, so exactly the same subject matter. It was about the predecessor regulations which contained identical provisions with difficult, different numbering. And uh, having found that France was at liberty to adopt stricter measures, the court then explained what the relevant approach was to testing the legality of that material. That, that 
legislation. But the relevant test is set out in 53 and in 58 of Triton. I don't know Triton. I don't know if my lords have read this before. Paragraphs 53 and 58. If you can read those in the one say something great about them. So you see straight away, um, free movement of goods, provisions, directly effective treaty articles engaged, proportionality engaged, then 58 sets out the test to be applied in the circumstances. In particular, in assessing whether or not the least restrictive means test is met, there has to be an assessment requiring a specific analysis on the basis of scientific studies and the factual circumstances of the main proceedings. And that allies very closely with... Um, what is um, said in the later precautionary principle cases, and indeed more generally in relation to proportionality uh, by the court, Supreme Court in Lumsden, citing the case of Commission for Luxembourg. So that's the test. Can we then uh, briefly look at the Act, just to pick out its um, cardinal features, which I will take very quickly indeed. The court has read it carefully. scheme of the Act and its authorities bundle 1, tab 4. It's an extremely widely formulated prohibition on dealing in ivory, from which exemptions are then made and, and pretty much all forms of commercial activity other than simple use are prohibited including hiring uh, and matters of that kind so props businesses would be effective repairs businesses collect affected as well as the, the core uh, businesses for sale uh, of uh, antique ivory items there's a wide definitional clause in 1.4 that seems to operate to capture sales abroad. And there's a bit of a debate between us as to precisely what that means. It's a pretty ambiguous provision, with respect. And then there are the carve-outs. The first carve-out is for uh, items of outstanding, artistic, etc., value and importance in Section 2. There's a couple of points to note here. First of all, the date pre-1918, that's a significant change from pre-1947, and it has the unfortunate effect of making incapable of exemption uh, items that were previously uh, lawfully traded and may be themselves of outstanding significance. A couple of examples are given uh, in the submission of Miss Bandini, D1, uh, tab 20, page 316 to 317. I can summarise them as follows. There were some Netsky carvers operating in the tail end period just after 20, uh, 2000, uh, 1918 whose works would not benefit from exemption. And likewise, there's a fair bit of highly significant art deco art incorporating ivory elements that would not conceivably benefit from exemption because of this restricted time period. So it's narrow in time and it's narrow in terms of its gateway because although we haven't been provided the criteria by regulations, it's avowedly intended to capture only the smallest uh, uh, number of items. Only the most outstanding items will be passed through this process of uh, expert museum assessment. There's provisions for appeal, uh, certification, etc. We needn't go through those. Then there's a portraits miniature exception in section 6. Again, that operates by reference to a 1918 cut-off. That's unproblematic, as it happens, because the phenomenon of portrait miniatures on ivory stopped uh, long before that. Uh, small surface area. They have to be registered. And this exemption was introduced in the course of the debates in the Act because it was accepted that these items were valued not for their ivory content, but because of the skill in the portrait miniature painting. 
and the, the lack of visibility of the underlying eyebrow, which is used to convey skin tone, etc. Then you have the de minimis exemption in 7. Very low threshold, 10%. That was the subject of much uh, toing and froing in the um, legislative period. Pre-1947 and registration. And there are all kinds of problems with such a low threshold in relation to calculation for working out how much inlay you have and whether or not it's on the right side of the line. <coughs> and it may also present um, simple transactional hassle problems. Suppose you have a chest of drawers with some ivory inlay on the knobs. You may be below the 10%, but you're nevertheless going to have to register the item if you want to sell it with all the transactional costs that go with it. And so this provision not only excludes, it also has a chilling effect that goes uh, uh, beyond that scope. You said it's a very low threshold. It is. Uh, I think I read somewhere in the papers that somebody described the Californian law as being the gold standard. Uh, I understand that they have 5%. Yes, and that's on intrastate trade. And it doesn't affect the interstate uh, trade. So if you're, for instance, selling from California to New York or vice versa, different thresholds apply. One's got to be quite careful with the American uh, provisions for precisely that reason. They look quite impressive in isolation, but once you understand how they work in the framework of federal law, they operate quite differently. So the California law is intrastate yes. California? Yes. And there are different federal <laughs> thresholds, and of course the federal thresholds also govern import and export into and out of the, the US. Then um, there's the exemption for pre-1975 musical instruments. You can see a different bright line being drawn here to reflect the fact that uh, ivory was being used until comparatively recently in keyboards. There's a registration obligation again. Uh, a couple of points to note about this. There's no value threshold, and there's nothing actually linking uh, this uh, uh, exemption to items that are being used professionally, or being seriously used. So a knackered old piano, whose value may lie in the reuse of its ivory keys, is just as much benefited by this section as some masterpiece of the 18th century. <coughs> then one has acquisitions by qualifying museums in section 9. And again, like all these exemptions, it works on a registration basis. Uh, pretty much all arts council museums will benefit from this, as well as large international museums. And then you have the registration provisions in section 10. And then a couple of other points of detail. You should note the definition of ivory in section 37, page 28. I don't know if you've looked at this already. It means the tooth of an elephant. An elephant means subsection 8, within the family Elephantidae. And that excludes mammoth ivory. And as you may have picked up from the papers, there is a burgeoning market for mammoth ivory harvested from the permafrost in Siberia, sometimes in truly grueling conditions. But mammoth ivory is now widely used as a substitute for elephant ivory, whether for repair work, keys on pianos, or massive of that kind. It's an entirely unregulated um, commodity. I suppose there is no risk of them becoming extinct. There's no risk of them becoming extinct. What the papers do demonstrate is that there's a risk of fresh elephant ivory being passed off as mammoth ivory. So there is that risk. Uh, and then commencement, um, section 43, page 33, um, the regulations to commence these sections have not yet been passed. So that's the Act. That's the second of my two introductory topics. The third... One of the things that we would require some assistance from you in due course is the fact that the first warning of the ban was with the consultation paper some three years ago. Yes. It isn't yet in effect. Yes, and that's a factor relied upon as a tempering factor yeah. for the harm caused by the Act, which is a subject I'll come back to at various points. Our short answer is, almost immediately, the Act produced very substantial chilling effects on the value of the ivory question. And the best evidence is that the value 
of items drop by anything up to, to 90% in consequence of the Act. And there's analysis of that in the Wood Newton report. Worldwide or just in the just UK? Just in the UK. So there's still an international market? Yes, but the difficulty is getting <laughs> getting the products to the international market. And one can immediately see that there's a, there's a, a, a cost-benefit analysis to be conducted by reference to the value of the item and the cost of getting it to an international market. So that may work for the most expensive items. It doesn't work for a £2,000 table, by way of contrast. <coughs> so in terms of the impact, uh, all of the witnesses have decried uh, the losses that will ensue if this ban is um, introduced and the very many items that will be, over time, destroyed or lost forever. And, and perhaps it's tempting to think, when you read those passages... There's, a, there's a, a whiff of hyperbole about it, but I'd encourage you to actually stop and think and, and, and contemplate how this act is going to bite over time. Because one of the key things that happens with this legislation is the removal of a market. And what a market does is joins up people who have things but are willing to part with them with those who want them and are willing to pay for them. Take an inlay table worth, let's say, £2,000, because it's well made, it's a nice piece of 18th or 19th century craftsmanship, for those that like such things. And let's suppose it's got more than 10% ivory in the inlay. Or take a walking stick of the kind owned by Mr Moss, large head, larger than 10% by volume of the uh, uh, item as a whole. On the death of the current owner of that stick, which can't be sold, or that table that can't be sold, one of two things is going to happen. It's going to be inherited by someone who wants it, or it's going to be inherited by someone who doesn't want it and doesn't really care about it and doesn't wish to look after it. Now, happenstance as to which of the two it is. But if it's the latter, the thing is either going to get thrown away or treated with neglect because it has no value, encouraging you to keep it well. And what's going to happen over time is that these items will effectively go off to those... Um, Terrible house clearances we've all had to go through when we've lost our parents. The items that no one in the family wants, that can't be sold. Ordinarily, they're auctioned at regional auction houses or matters of that kind. But the auction houses won't touch these things. So they can't be registered. It's unlawful to sell them. You're exposing yourself to a quarter of a million pound fine. They'll go to landfill. That's what will happen over time, as items come to be inherited by people who uh, don't want them. Or take the table. Imagine the table is damaged. Now, let's say your child runs into the table and breaks its leg. The table's leg, not the child's leg. <laughs> and let's say it would cost £500 to repair the table. You might be prepared to do that if you know that the table's value of £2,000 is going to be maintained and restored. But if the table's worthless, chances are you're going to think, well, that table's had a good innings, time to get rid of it. And that's what this act is going to do. Over time, all of those items, particularly the utilitarian items, that don't have the big headline number figures, you know, 20,000, 100,000 pounds, even if they're not outstanding, those smaller items are over time going to get damaged, thrown away, or parted from people who value them. And once they're parted from people who value them, they're likely to be disposed of. Now, the museum market is no answer to that, because the museums <coughs> aren't going to want to have every one of the two million bits of ivory floating around in the economy. They're not going to want to have a perfectly good representative day-to-day -day sample of household furniture, an inlay table, costing £2,000. They're certainly not going to want to have more than one of them. Uh, <coughs> so the museum market is no answer. Those items will be destroyed. And that is the circumstance that my clients, who appreciate and love these items, fear. These things will, over time, be destroyed. That is the consequence of the loss of value. And that's the consequence for our cultural heritage, the history, even before you get to the financial impact of the measure. Uh, I'll come back to the financial impact of the measure. That has been modelled by the Wood-Newton report. The judge adopted a perfectly sensible, in-the-round approach to that evidence. He said it was necessarily approximate, as it confessed it to be. It having confessed the methodological shortcomings it faced, it was an entirely conventional report of the kind the government itself would ordinarily produce. That's what Wood Newton very often does. 
the judge says it may be that figure, it may be half that figure, it matters not. But we're still talking about losses of hundreds of millions of pounds concentrated in few hands. Those who collect anti-divery fans, those who collect net skis, those who collect <coughs> walking sticks with ivory handles. So that's the impact. Now let me turn to the legal topics. And the first topic is intensity of review. We address this at our skeleton, paragraphs 34 to 37. And the issue, um, shortly put, is this. Is the intensity of review heightened because fundamental human rights are in play? Here, Article 16 and 17 of the Charter, or Article 1, Protocol 1 of the Convention. Is it heightened because they are engaged and run in parallel with and aligned with the EU free movement right. <coughs> now the Charter is in Authorities Bundle 3, Tab 24. A couple of points to note. First of all, Article 16 freedom to conduct a business, is a codification of the CJEU's case law, identifying that as a separate fundamental right. It has a separate life to A1P1, so very similar contours. Article 17, the right to property, is modelled deliberately and closely on Article 1, Protocol 1. Article 16 is a fairly qualified right, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah in much the same way that A1P1 is. And then, um, critically for present purposes, can I ask you to uh, uh, note Article 52, page 406 at the top, because this is a specific enactment in the Charter of a concept in the Convention. Any limitation on the exercise of rights or freedoms recognised by this Charter must be provided for by law, no problem there, and respect the essence of those rights and freedoms. So there you have the Delimi style ECHR reasoning being carried over and applied in relation to the Charter. And what that tells you is that there is an intensity of review that is geared, if you like, incrementally to the degree of intrusion. The more uh, uh, gross or far-reaching the intrusion upon a particular protected right, the more intense the review that is required. Is the Charter still part of domestic law? Yes. Section 5, subsection 4 of the 2018 Act, I think has been amended, but we, we seem to have the original provision. Yes, but the current um, operative provisions uh, are Section 1A of the European Withdrawal Act, which, well, defined, which that's the definition of union law, which includes the fundamental charter, and that's brought into effect by we, sections one and two. Which Act. gives effect to union law yeah. in pursuance of part four of the Withdrawal Act, and it's particularly Article 127 of no, the no, Withdrawal no, Act. But, but section five, subsection four of the 2018 Act, yes. which is in the bundle, yes. still on its face, says it no longer is part of, of domestic law, after yes. exit I, I think, unfortunately, the version in the bundle yeah. is pre uwaga That's what I thought. Yes. Pre the 20 Act. So yes. you have to look at the 20 Act, which amends the 80 could, could, could we just please have at some point... Of course. And one thing I should emphasise is that I have sought to clarify with Sir James, and I don't know where we are, what the position is, because I rather anticipated you'd be interested in knowing what the position is now and what the position is as of the 31st of December this year. Uh, my understanding of the position is now it's just as it was before the 31st, yes. and that's because of Section 1A and Part 4, uh, and the giving effect of Part 4 by that. So effectively, the European Communities Act is killed and then brought back to life for 11 months. Um, that's the scheme of operation. Come the 31st at 12 o'clock. 11 p.m. 11 p.m. 12 o'clock European time. <laughs> <laughs> Come that time, uh, effectively, there will be no provisions in the Withdrawal Act that apply in these circumstances, because although there are Part 3 provisions applying to goods on the market, 
they do not apply to animal products, and ivory is an animal product as defined. So, but for that, the provisions in Part 3, Title 1 would apply. But there have been EU exit regulations made, which are in the bundle, that adapt and apply the principle and the implementing regulation to confer upon AFA, the domestic agency, the powers previously in the Commission. And that effectively means all the provisions that you saw in the principle and implementing regulations are now powers of our domestic authorities. And that includes, for instance, the power to introduce an export ban under Article 5.2d. Now, I've asked Sir James if, if that's an agreed position. I, I hope it is, and no doubt he'll explain in due course. <coughs> uh, the one mystery is what's going to happen to Article uh, 36 TFEU, which at the moment is retained EU law under Section 4, the directly effective treaty right, but a number of directly effective treaty rights have had EU exit regulations made, and they're made by primary legislation uh, planned in that space. So I think this point isn't in your scope's market. It isn't, my lord, but it would be quite helpful if once you've reached the agreement you could put that down on one of side of a piece of paper. Yes, of course. <coughs> I, I, I've done that already. I think I'm just waiting for the answer. So we'll, we'll get that to you, my lord. So the, the question here is, is there anything that turns upon the fact that the free movement principle is pulling in exactly the same direction as the uh, uh, freedom to conduct business or right to property argument? And the answer to that is very clearly, yes, there is. Once you have those rights aligned, there is a more intense review required of the measure. And the authority for that is the Festerson case, Authorities Bundle 4, tab 38. Now, this was a case about uh, uh, Danish agricultural holdings and a requirement to reside in the particular farm in question, uh, or otherwise incur penalties, that was designed to preclude speculation in agricultural land. And the measure in question interfered not only with free movement of uh, uh, capital and establishment, but also the enjoyment of the property that the person in question owned. And the question was whether or not this coincidence of interference impacted upon the intensity <coughs> of the view. And the relevant analysis is at page 209, starting at paragraph 34, through to the end of 39. Would my lords like to read that in the army? Thank you. you can see is the court says you must take into account both interests and then pulling in the same direction means that the measure turns out to be particularly restrictive that's the language of 37 and that then impacts upon how you approach the least restrictive means test and this perhaps relatively self-evident proposition is also uh, explained by the leading uh, book on free movement of goods Oliver on free movement authorities bundle 4 tab 49. In particular, paragraph 860, page 242. And he contrasts uh, the cases where the free movement right is pulling in the same direction as the uh, fundamental right, like Festerson, like ERT, with situations where fundamental rights are in conflict with free movement, like Schmidtberger 
and familiar press. Schmidtberger was the case about uh, protests at one of the uh, high alpine passes in Austria that was impeding free movement of goods. And their protected interests were in opposition to each other. And the simple proposition is that they reinforce the four freedoms and that in that circumstance restrictions become harder to justify as in ERT. Now, the judge's reasoning on this point is brief. It's at 165 of the judgment. That's core bundle, tab 6, page He says he cannot accept that the uh, Charter adds anything of substance to the relevant freedoms of the TFEU. And with respect, that's wrong. And it's um, uh, compounded um, by his um, error at 168, where he says about halfway down that whether or not the concept of the essence of the right is applicable at all in an EU case is less clear but he doesn't have to decide the matter in the abstract. That's also wrong, because Article 52 says it applies in terms, and that provision was cited to the judge. <coughs> so it's a, it's a point in intensity of review, and when combined with everything else that follows in our submission, it's important, because the judge having already identified a significant number of factors correctly, that led to a heightened intensity of review, such as the uh, type of case within the Lumsden categorization, the extent of the harm done, the absence of proper evaluation of harm leading to a loss of deference. All of those points with respect to the judge, he was right on. But here was a yet further factor pointing to intense review. Now, the answer <coughs> that's given to this is effectively uh, two points made in reliance of the Festerson case, and you can see this in my learned friend's skeleton argument at tab 28. <coughs> and the simple answer to, to these points is with respect, they misread, misread uh, the authority that they cite. The flavour case. And they don't engage with the clear reasoning in Festerson. Because the Flager case, uh, which one finds in Authorities Bundle 4, tab 41, is authority only for the limited proposition that you only need do one proportionality analysis. You can combine it. But there's no point doing a fundamental human rights analysis if the measure has already failed a separate free movement analysis. And equally, you should be funneling them all into one analysis. And one can see the very limited ratio of the case at page 1227. Because what where, is the, where is the case? Uh, authorities Bundle 4, tab 41. Free movement of services case. And in essence, what happened was that the court concluded at 56 that the measure was disproportionate from the perspective of Article 56 TFEU. And all they said at 57 to 60 was that that being so, no separate analysis under the Charter was required. It's a bit like the reasoning one very often sees in the Strasbourg court, where they say, having found for you on this basis, they don't need to look at the case on this alternative basis. It is not authority answering the Festerson 
proposition, which is that where the two are aligned, they lead to a more restrictive intensity of review. That's plainly a separate issue that this case didn't address. So where that error leaves us is that we have a further factor to add to the four that the judge already found in our favour, <coughs> uh, leading to an intense review. And those other factors were, just for my Lord's list, secondly, that the Act interfered with EU free movement rights. Thirdly, that it derogated from harmonising EU legislation. That's the principal and subsidiary regulation in order to do so. In other words, the fact that it was an Article 193 override was a fact that led to stricter control. <coughs> the proper analysis under Lumsden, and in particular Lumsden paragraphs 37 and 38, where the judge at 160 of the judgment rejected the government's submission that this was simply an exercise of national competence. That point hasn't been appealed. The fourth factor was that degree of pre-existing harmonisation. And the fifth factor was that the Act doesn't merely interfere with rights, but strikes at or near their essence. In our case, in relation to that last point, you've had from my opening remarks, for businesses, removing of value is removing everything of utility about this property right. Residual possessory rights are meaningless, and indeed that's the case for many individuals. It's not a situation like a professional musician with their piano, where there's an opportunity to uh, recover value through use. So that's topic one. Topic two, and this is probably the largest of my topics, is the precautionary principle, because it is at the heart uh, we say, of the judgment and its error. And we address this at paragraph 61 to 64 of our skeleton argument. <coughs> and as we point out, it wasn't so much as mentioned by the government below, nor, and we've checked, is the precautionary principle mentioned in the impact assessments, the RPC reviews thereof, any of the consultation documents. This wasn't policy made on the back of a precautionary approach. There's no evidence, forget labels and form, there's no evidence of the sort of risk investigation and then risk assessment that is the hallmark of the precautionary principle. And yet, despite that, it wasn't just given a role in the judgment, it was, we say, properly analysed, the decisive feature of the judgment. <coughs> so let's just have a look at the way it creeps in to the judgment. <coughs> and the starting point for that analysis is paragraph 155. It deals with the interaction between what were called methods one and two domestic effects, export effects, and methods uh, three and four, which is encouraging others to act, leadership, etc., on the one hand, and solidarity, method four, for those who've acted already. <coughs> and it's particularly at page 122, where having said uh, that Lumsden made it clear that an economic or social justification would need to be supported by evidence, and remember please what I showed you in paragraph 58 of Trident, showed that that was the approach uh, required in this specific area. The judge says there are two important considerations that need to emphasise. The first is that moral and political judgments are not irrelevant. They may be properly invoked as soon as some evidence exists. This means that Mr. Pullen's third and fourth justifications cannot work in isolation, but they may be seen to have force once some evidence has been identified supporting the first and or second rationales. So what effectively happens on that approach is you switch focus from a 
scientific or causation based investigation is it causally linked to some form of political or wider moral judgment that doesn't seem to be so grounded. And then the second feature is, he says the second consideration is that the precautionary principle clearly applies in this area. See Article 1912 TFEU, which is a general statement of the fact that the precautionary principle applies when making scientific environmental policy. If you're going to adopt a wastewater directive or a bird's habitat directive or something of that kind, you apply a precautionary principle to the science. And then Sir James did not mention this in terms, correct, it wasn't mentioned at all in terms or otherwise, and Mr Delamere ignored it. Well, I ignored it because it wasn't <laughs> argued. But this was no doubt what the former had in mind when he emphasised in all argument the importance of risk. But what is striking is that whatever Sir James said about risk and a risk-based investigation simply isn't reflected in the underlying materials. It's not in the impact assessment. It's not a risk-based approach. And I know that some of the members of court, the court will have grappled with such a risk-based approach, whether it's in relation to the smoking ban or in other areas. The hallmarks of a risk-based approach are clear. You identify the controversy and the area unresolved by science. And science doesn't just mean white lab coats. It means econometrics or other forms of investigation to prove chains of causation. And if the evidence is conclusive, inconclusive but nevertheless consistent with the theory, you can then work on the basis of risk. So that's the first hook for the precautionary principle. Then have a look at how... It mutates at 176, because having effectively discounted method one, which is the evidence about fresh ivory in the UK, and said effectively there's little or no appetite or evidence thereof, he comes to method two, which is the issue of export, and he says, in my judgment, the evidence which bases... 176, page 126. The evidence base is stronger in connection with Mr. Pullen's second justification but then this, but it's still not particularly compelling. I've already summarised it. Overall, I've characterised it somewhat of a melange of evidential shards varying in their weight, anecdote, and inference and or opinion. The latter often very strongly held and emotionally expressed. I think that's a reference to some of the NGO submissions, which are um, properly impassioned, and therefore uh, not necessarily entirely dispassionate. However, Mr. Pullen's proposition, that, that is, the export contributes to the allure of ivory per se, and as an indirect driver to importations of fresh ivory into foreign markets, is as difficult to prove as it is to disprove. And the operation of the precautionary principle means that he does not have to prove it to me to the probabilistic standard at all. There is some evidence, but he's already said it's not particularly compelling, the challenge is to see where it leads. And then having effectively accepted in large part uh, the strength of our submissions on this issue, that it's just a straightforward non sequitur to simply assume that um, a demand for antique ivory equates to something that will support or give a lure to uh, fresh uh, uh, ivory. He then rejects what he describes in 178 as a, an overly granular, analytically, analytical and exactingly microeconomic approach. This is not a case before the cat. I consider one needs to stand back and give weight to softer factors, which may be described as cultural, applying this with some sensitivity, some sensitivity behavioural, perceptual and stigmatic. And it's those softer factors which are with respect to difficult to identify in evidence, that seem to then play the clinching role in the acceptance <coughs> of this uh, argument. Uh, note, for instance, paragraph 181, where he says, the application of the precautionary principle to Mr. Pullen's second justification leads me to conclude that it may be supported because there is some evidence of the indirect causal connection which he propounds particularly when the second justification is conjoined with the third and fourth, which are judgments about leadership and solidarity, 
it's not difficult to conclude that the measures in the Act, subject to narrow exemptions, are not inappropriate for its purpose. And then look at the second sentence of 182. I have agreed with Mr. Delamere that if the first and second justifications amount to, to zero, then these further leadership and solidarity justifications cannot be additive. But in my view, that's not the position. I endorse Mr. Pullen's estimation that the third and fourth justification are important. Though I'd in place greater importance on the fourth, that's solidarity with, say, the US, which has tightened up uh, its market. So that is a precautionary approach, and it's the approach to the Category 2 export issues that is the narrow window through which this case then passes and upon which Ground 3 and 4 are built. Without those foundations, the judge accepts that they go nowhere. Now, <coughs> we say that the basic error is that for the precautionary principle to be engaged at all, there must be much more than simply some evidence, whatever that means. There must be concrete and discernible risks based upon an assessment of reliable, independent and scientific or other forms of rigorous analysis. And it's that risk that must have been assessed by the decision maker so as to lead to the decision. It can't be invoked after the event as some kind of port in a storm. And in this respect, we think that there is an important difference between EU law and ECHR law. And it may be only a difference in relation to the precautionary principle, as you'll see when we come to the case law. But what is accepted by all parties is that when you're looking at the convention, the ECHR, all that matters is proportionality in the round. And the authority for that are the Begum and Ain't Misbehaving cases in <coughs> bundle A10, uh, I think, uh, A1, 10 and 11, cited in my learned friend's skeleton argument at paragraph 55, 3, Roman 1. They are authority for the proposition that there is, in ECHR cases, no procedural dimension to the proportionality principle. They're also authority for the fact that if the decision maker did not take the relevant interests into account, that is a factor that affects the degree, if any, of deference to be paid to the decision maker. So let's say, as in ain't misbehaving, uh, you've got a licensing decision about a sex shop and you do or don't take into account the um, freedom of speech or freedom of property angles to running a sex shop. <coughs> the proportionality case is what it is at the end of the day. The fact that you haven't taken it into account is neither here nor there. But the fact that you haven't consciously considered it may affect the degree of deference that the court will pay you. That's, that's the conventional an established position under the ECHR, and there was a brief um, <coughs> consideration of the deference angles in the speeches in Ain't Misbehaving of uh, Lady Hale and Lord Newberger, citing Lord Hoffman from Begum. But the precautionary principle operates quite differently. Uh, can I show you two authorities to establish that, both in volume four? The first is the Advocate General case in the Confederation Pisan case, Grand Chamber decision about the interpretation of legislation. What's the reference? Uh, bundle 4, tab 4 of the authorities. The underlying dispute con concerned interpretation of legislation regulating genetically modified organ organisms. Sorry, bundle 4, tab 4. 44. 44, sorry. key thing to note about both these authorities I'm going to show you is they are both environmental cases. And we are dealing with an exemption from EU law on environmental grounds. So it's on point. It shows the approach to the precautionary principle in an environmental case. 
fleshing out what may be required of stricter measures within the area permitted by the Trident type of case. So these are environmental cases. And the Advocate General's analysis of the precautionary principle starts at AG 47, page 330 of the report. Advocate General Bobek. Can I ask you to read 47 through to 54? And I'll make some, some submissions. summarises that in paragraph 148 at page 345. A number of themes emerge from this. First of all, it's a doctrine that works by reference to evidence. You must gather the relevant evidence for the relevant points of inquiry. There are no axiomatic prescriptions to go back to the master of the roles question about the types of evidence required. That's a function of the type of risk under assessment and what can sensibly be done to investigate the relevant issue in dispute. And here, the relevant issue in dispute are the chains of indirect causation between export of antique items and demand for fresh ivory. That's the subject to which evidence must be considered and directed. So first of all, it's a doctrine based on evidence. Mere doubts Mere surmises, conjecture, hypotheses, etc. do not suffice. The second point, it's a doctrine that entails the conscious consideration of alternatives by the decision maker. In effect, it's an exercise of discretion. And that, I think, explains why, by contrast to the convention analysis, how you go about the decision is important. Because at the end of the day, in terms of convention ana analysis, all that matters is the right answer. The matter is either proportionate or not. But when you're dealing with the precautionary principle, you're dealing with a range of permitted responses to a particular uncertainty. And there may be no right answer to that. That's why you can't invoke the principle after the event, because that is special pleading. That is the very type of danger identified in case law as old as Ermakov, where the decision maker says after the events, oh, well, it's justified by the precautionary principle. And that wasn't the foundation of the actual decision or measure. Although they may not have used that label, <coughs> isn't that in substance what Mr. Pollan's evidence says? What's the thinking about indirect position? 
Uh, with respect, we don't accept that. And I'm, I'm going to look at Mr. Pollard's evidence. I'm going to show you the impact assessment, which, sycophant that I am, we say applying the approach of Mr. Justice Green in the Basker case is the first place to go to because it effectively says this is the reasoning at the time. This is the approach that we're adopting at the time. You have to be a little bit careful about after the event evidence. Uh, look at the impact assessment. And what is particularly revealing in this context is what is and is not in the impact assessment and then the criticisms made of it by the RPC, one of which is you haven't identified the actual or potential benefits of this measure in conservation terms. Can you spell them out? To which the answer is deafening silence. Can I ask you this? Do you say that the analysis should have been focused upon risk associated with exports from the United Kingdom? Yes, because that is now the focal point of this case. Does this interrelate with the, the sort of third and fourth objective, which is the political aims and objects, if you like? Can, could one country ever establish causally that standing alone it, it, it exerted a significant effect upon demand for ivory? Or will that only really arise when you have a very large coalition of countries all operating the same ban? Yes, you can uh, establish it causally, or it's capable of investigation to the point of uh, uh, reason-informed information. Let me explain why. One of the questions you will no doubt ask yourself, if asking if your export market of antiques contributes to a lure in a foreign market that has a dual, lawful and illegal ivory market, is whether the type of item that is being exported is the kind of item that supports the demand for illegal ivory. So, all of the evidence in this case tends to show that the items which are desired for their ivory content rather than their craftsmanship are pure ivory carvings or jewellery or bracelets, bang bangles, ivory beads, ivory rings, matters of that kind. And you'll see when I show you the materials, Ample, ample materials, both from my clients and from the NGOs, saying that's the focal point of concern in the problem market. And the question that then arises is, does the export of all and every type of ivory, that is antique ivory to those markets, contribute to that demand? And let, you, let me give you <coughs> an example that proves the point. Go back to my £2,000 marketry table. If there is simply no market in China for marketry tables, or that market is confined only to those with the most rarefied uh, taste in Western art, the prospects of the export of that table contributing meaningfully to the poaching of an elephant is nugatory. The export of beautiful 18th century cutlery uh, for serving fish, which we've got some pictures of, that have ivory handles. If there's no market for that type of item at all in the Far East, or a market only amongst certain consumers, who are consumers not in the least bit interested in ivory, but interested in artistic objects, that will not contribute to uh, the allure of ivory. And those matters are readily capable of investigation. Now, there are, there are we accept, some items that were being exported which were problematic. Let me give you a very simple example. Antique billiard balls. That may sound silly, but they were being exported in very large numbers because they were capable of being recarved. And if your analysis of your export data shows a great big blip in export of billiard balls, or of cheap pianos. Why are people exporting cheap pianos as opposed to pianos? Take off the veneer from the keys and use them to make picture frames or matters of that kind. All of that is capable of investigation. But are, I mean, are there in fact statistics about the number of billiard balls being exported? We don't know because the respondent didn't investigate the data, didn't make any material inquiries. And it's not as if this point was not raised. It was raised by 
the World Wildlife Fund in its submissions because the position it was pushing for was a situation in which only outstanding items could be exported, but in which there was a residual domestic market, domestic alone, for items of high value or cultural significance. They made a conscious difference between export of high, outstanding items which should be permitted and, and uh, high value items, the kind of items my clients wish to continue to trade, which they said could continue to be traded domestically. And why could they continue to be traded domestically? Because they accepted there was no problem in the UK market. Now, in the absence of any investigation of the data, what you have and what the judge relied upon is a mass of anecdotal evidence, which when you actually go to it, like the Gao report <coughs> explaining the allure of ivory and academic investigation, when you look at it, it's all about carvings. It's all about 100% ivory carvings, which co correlates exactly with what my clients said to be the position. And so when you come back to the precautionary principle, you have to ask yourself, has this decision maker actually investigated the very risk that they say is critical to driving the continued demand in the foreign markets? And the answer is they haven't. They simply blithely assumed that any ivory being purchased by an Asian customer is being purchased for its potential ivory content, which is a dangerous assumption because all that rising trends of export to uh, Asia shows is rising disposable wealth in Asia. There may be the rise of an Asian middle class collecting Western items because of their beauty. It doesn't prove anything. Or they point to the fact that ivory carvings are imitated in fresh ivory without investigating whether or not there is any export of those types of carvings and whether or not those problems could be addressed simply by banning the export of that type of item. Why ban the marketry table if it's not going to contribute to a year in China? And all the more, why ban its sale in the UK? What's that got to do with protecting elephants? What's the focus of your challenge? It's on the ban in its entirety. I was looking at paragraph 23 of your skeleton. Defines your, the challenge, the focus of your attack in pretty broad terms. <coughs> yes, but you're suggesting now that there should have been very fine gradations between different types of item which could and could not be exported because some have a greater propensity to be recarved. It's, yes. it's Our position is this, my lord. The ban in its current shape is disproportionate. It is perfectly possible to envisage a range of alternative formulations that make further exemptions or exceptions that, that address that point. And some obvious ones are either a targeted export ban upon items that are shown to be or thought to be on the basis of evidence risking maintaining allure in ivory per se, or if that exercise proves too different, too difficult, a simple export ban with continued domestic trade being permitted so that a collector of a net ski in the UK can sell a, a net ski to another UK net ski collector. How on earth is that sale going to contribute any form of risk? That's the question. So <coughs> the approach of the Advocate General is plainly evidence-based have to make a relevant investigation of the relevant area of concern and then the decision maker has to make a conscious so judgment. One of the points that's being made rightly or wrongly is that uh, part of the uh, overall attempt is to delegitimise uh, uh, the concept of ivory, objects of ivory, being things that one should want. Yes, my lord. And the problem with that argument is it it strays almost completely from the type of scientific preservation of animals, preservation of the habitat argument that is justified per Trident as being a proper environmental basis for permitting... Why is there a proper political judgment to be made? A political judgment... To be made, in terms of leadership, in terms of trying to... The overall political... If there's a political objective here, which is to restrict trade in ivory to make it less alluring and for the country to be uh, 
that the leader in that in, in that projected. Why, why is it why is it illegitimate to try to as part of that endeavour uh, to try to as I said delegitimise it in the eyes of the public, ivory as something which should be desired and traded and so on generally. I'm just trying to as you were put a response to your saying you're, you're saying what's wrong with intra country trading of ivory? What way does that possibly affect? Illegal dealings, illegitimate dealings uh, in ivory. And what I'm putting to you, one of the objectives is, generally speaking, to try to delegitimise the idea of ivory as something which is to be desired. Because, my lord, it has to ultimately be rationally connected in some way, through some causative link, <coughs> to the continued protection of elephants alive in Africa today. That's the short answer. And there are two. There are two alternative scenarios. You can either say the delegitimization in the export market, because that's what we're concerned with, will lead to a decrease in demand in the export market for fresh ivory and thereby indirectly um, uh, save uh, elephants. That's one chain of causation. Or the alternative, and this is the one I flagged at the outset that takes you into the starkest ground for proportionality, strict to sense to compensation, is to say... We accept that there is no connection between safe trade in antique ivory, but we're making a judgment that we should make this product anathema somehow uh, in order to signify our uh, complete opposition to this as a product and thereby produce indirect, indirect benefits in relation to um, uh, the drivers of demand in this area. And that's the argument really takes you into the starkest form of proportionality strict to sensu, because what it's saying effectively is a perfectly um, lawful, uh, uh, harmless, in the sense of producing no harms to elephants today business, must be closed at great expense to those uh, individuals with no compensation. And that is, that is um, a long way, it seems to us, from being any kind of fair balance under the convention. It's very different, even from the handgun scenario. We can see selling handguns carries with it a risk that the person who's registered to have the handgun is in fact emotionally unstable and commits a mass shooting. That's much more closely causally linked to the problem in question. This is many levels of contingency removed. As I understand your answer, and maybe perfectly correct answer, your answer to my inquiry is, um, uh, I'm using your language, I think it's used in scope and arguments, anathematization yes. of the concept of dealing with ivory. Is too um, is based on on, on insufficient uh, material, insufficient and insufficient statistical or scientific material to form the basis of a proportionality assessment. Absolutely. And if you want to go into that, your answer is: if you want to do it that way, you have to provide compensation. I think that's how you're putting well, it. To me. First of all, you have to provide some evidence to show that it's going to achieve some meaningful change. You can't anathematize, make something anathema for anathema's sake. It's got, to, it's got to produce some benefit in the proportionality analysis or in the precautionary principle analysis. So it's got to produce some upside. And we'll see that particularly when we come to uh, the, the court case uh, uh, applying the precautionary principle. There's a further feature emphasised in Advocate General Bobek's analysis and emphasised in the other cases that the invocation of the precautionary principle is typically temporary. So it's typically a ring-holding type response to address a situation whilst uh, the evidential position is resolved. That's why, when you look at, say, the smoking ban, there was a, a concrete guarantee of review, I think, within two years. The same with Quasar. Indeed, one of the justifications I recall from the Quasar case was we're introducing this scheme precisely in order to generate better evidence about the problems of advocacy, criminal advocacy, so that we can make a more better tailored scheme. This scheme, by contrast, is a one-way ratchet. To use my Lord the Master of the Rolls terms, it's designed to anathematise on a permanent basis. And there will be no going back. Uh, the judge refers to that, I think, at paragraph uh, 184 as just the sort of irreversible step along the road to uh, making a, a either anathematised, save where a compelling evidence-based justification for a narrow exemption is made out. 
So precautionary principles are invariably ring-holding or temporary in nature. That's um, Advocate General Bobek. Um, the courts didn't address the proportionary principle. Is, 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 the, is the evidential material sufficient if it just comes from experts who express their opinion? Because at some point you seem to be saying it has to be more than that. It has to be, for example, I think you were suggesting, an analysis of export figures and import figures and things like that. <laughs> in an area like this, which is very much a matter of the thought of judgment, is it sufficient that there are people who are experts in the field to express the view? Is that not enough? Well, it depends what they're expressing a view on, if that's not too sinuous an answer, my lord. Um, but in, in relation to something like the linkage between export of antiques and increasing demand for fresh ivory, we, we would say that that is capable of some form of systematic analysis that may be both quantitative and qualitative in nature. And yes, the qualitative dimension is uh, opinion evidence. Uh, and it's relevant that the opinion evidence of the relevant people, both the expert antique dealers on my side and the NGOs on the other side, is that the problem area is in relation to 100% or near 100% ivory carvings. That is the problem area. No one's suggesting it's about fish cutlery or marquetry or antique pestles or antique fans, or anything of that kind. And that there are, obviously, these judgmental lines is shown by the lines drawn from the exemptions, because what underlies the portrait miniatures exemption, what underlies the, mini uh, the musical instruments exemption, is the insight that these items are valued not because of their ivory content, but because of their beauty as a musical instrument, or because of their beauty as a portrait miniature, and no one buying these items is going to do so because of their base ivory content. That's the entire rationale of those exemptions. And we say, if that's the rationale of those exemptions, it applies just as much to a Netsky. So, <coughs> the second case, uh, Velazza, a very recent uh, uh, decision of the 10th Chamber with the President Lennart's uh, sitting, it's tab 45 of the bundle. It's another environmental case. It's a waste case. The relevant summary of the precautionary principle in the court's judgment is at 57 through to 59. If you could read that, please. You see, once again, an emphasis on the prior possession of comprehensive uh, assessments of risk based upon the most reliable scientific data. And scientific, we take to mean, in the lucid sense, uh, you know, qualitative and quantitative research. And then, importantly, at 58, it's not some open-ended assessment. There still has to be a likelihood, that's the word, likelihood, of real harm. So you can't be chasing any risk, however small and however remote. There is a qualitative threshold at the end of it. And obviously that's required, because otherwise the invocation of the precautionary principle is simply uh, a passport to doing pretty much uh, whatever you, in good faith, want to do. How is this done? Because the premise for paragraph 58 is that it's impossible on the basis of, let us say, statistical or econometric evidence to prove the risk but then the court says, but the likelihood of real harm persists should the risk materialise, and then the precautionary principle can nonetheless be resorted to. So the premise there is that there isn't any evidence, yet you can still use it. Well, you, you 
you probably are looking at things like correlation between uh, the phenomenon in question and the adverse effect that uh, is feared, the extent of the adverse effect that's being feared. So, for instance, in the present case, to what extent are the exports of uh, particular or all ivory items correlated with increased demand uh, for uh, fresh ivory? And to what extent is it a material increase, or is it barely perceptible, if at all? Let's assume that worldwide it's impossible to prove with clear and precise evidence, a causal connection, yet the government takes the view that if it adopts a leadership position, there will be a domino effect. Five, ten, fifteen other countries will over time adopt the same extreme position and that over time and cumulatively there will begin to be an impact. Does that fall within the precautionary principle? You can't, because it may be the case that no individual state can prove a material causative effect. We still say that there has to be a discernible, or identifiable, um, real harm in terms of impact on savannah elephants in this case and their current rates of poaching. Uh, and there has to be identified a likelihood. So, yes, um, there will be judgmental elements, my Lord is quite right, but the very first stage is to undertake an assessment of the best evidence in question. And that's what's missing from this case. That's, so what happens is effectively we critique the evidence that's available and the, the judge says it's very weak, it's very anecdotal etc but it's saved by the precautionary principle. What no one has ever done. Well, he, says this, he says there's some. There's some but what no one's ever done is actually look at that evidence and say do you know what that evidence re leads us to believe that here is the following risk, here's the likely harm that's going to result and here is what's going to happen if X, Y, and Z happens. That judgment just simply hasn't been taken. Now, I appreciate if we were in that type of case where there had been a conscientious investigation of the material, as some of the consultation submissions said there should be, and I'm going to show you what Bardo said about that, then we might be in a different position. But, but what you can't do is effectively try to use the precautionary principle to close the stable door after your main evidential route has failed. And that's effectively what the judge has used the precautionary principle for in this case. There was never the kind of conscientious risk assessment that this case law requires you to undertake. And that's the point. You know, I say, you go back to the impact assessment, it's simply not there. And you've got the RPC saying, well, have you done this exercise? To which the answer is silence. That's the problem. And, and because it's not there, and because we don't even have an assessment from the government side of the harm that the measure they're advocating is going to cause to collectors and businesses, the evidential position is completely unexplored. How can you have done a precautionary principle assessment if you have neither investigated the likelihood of gain and the probability of corresponding harm of the measure that you're taking? If it's a balancing exercise where you're assessing risk against countervailing risk, you can't have done that exercise if you don't have those inputs that you require. So, we say this case law shows that the precautionary principle isn't some kind of port in the storm. It's a test that brings with it its own rigours in how you go about making the decision. And had the Secretary of State invoked the precautionary principle, either in writing or in argument, we would have responded in that way. The final thing I wanted to show you from the European authorities were those materials we inserted to the back of Authorities Bundle 5. It's the Commission guidelines or communication on the precautionary principle from 20, to 2000, 2nd of February 2000. And the relevant uh, passage... Uh, I would draw to your attention uh, the new tab 54. That's right, my lord. The relevant passage starts at page 12 and runs through to um, the bottom of page 14. I'm not going to take you through that, but it, but it aligns in my submission uh, uh, closely with the approach of the court in Valazza. Sorry, pa paragraphs 2 to 12, did you? It's paragraph, it's, it's section 5, starting on page 12, 
through to the foot of page 14. Now, the task here is not one of formalism, readily accept. You've got to look at the substance of the underlying exercise. But I mentioned the case of uh, Basket that my Lord Lord Justice Green would call Authorities Bundle 5, tab 52. Where there was a similar issue about the quality of the evidence required to substantiate the government's case on private copying. And it's in particular holding three in the case, in the head note, at page 136 over to 137. Where you said what was required in that case was a proper combination of quantitative and qualitative analyses, for example surveys, in order then to draw inferences there was an element of art and judgment as well as science inherent in that exercise which should have been but had not been conducted. And that reflects um, effectively uh, the findings at paragraph 241 of the judgment, page 1515. And I would also flag 242 and 243, uh, particularly the dangers of after the event justification in witness list. From what I rec recollect of the dangers of accepting your submissions. <laughs> Always a danger, though, was that the, the, the impact assessment was relied upon heavily by the government and it was purported to contain an analysis of statistical and colometric data in which the inferences they drew just didn't exist. Yes, whereas what's different in this case is there's simply no analysis at all um, identifying any, any of these relevant risks. Now, my learned friend skeleton argument, paragraph 31, reads Valatza as being proposition uh, for the authority that so long as it's clear that an important public interest is being pursued, it doesn't matter that the available evidence is inconclusive. And that's, with respect, not right. Because the one thing that's absolutely clear, particularly from Advocate General Bobak's analysis, but also equally from the court, is that there is a minimum required evidential underpinning. And that simple good faith conjecture on the basis of shards of evidence will not um, suffice. <clears throat> so let's look at the materials and measure them against the, the relevant standard. Um, the first thing is the hunt for the negative. We've looked in the consultation papers, etc., that preceded the bill for anything that smacks of the precautionary principle whether in form or in substance, and we can't see anything. The closest, we think, that one gets to it is the topic of review, because the final impact assessment says that the policy will be reviewed in May 2023. The reference for that is uh, supplementary uh, materials bundle D1, 16278. But let's look at what the impact assessment does and doesn't say on the topic of policy objectives and intended effects. And that so starts... You want us to look at this? this yes, please, my lord. D116. This is the final IA, is it? This is the final IA. So this is the, the principal IA that we would have recourse to? Yes. And we have a review of the policy objectives and intended effects starting at 35. Mode 3 appears at 42. By bringing an end to the UK domestic ivory market, the UK will play its part in the global movement to take action on the ivory trade in line with action taken by others. 
in turn encouraging other countries to take action, depriving poachers of their market. Such leadership, by example, can be very influential, citing the UK Climate Change Act. Complement other actions that the UK is taking. Then there's a review of policy options at 44, and the various different policy options are considered. Then under the heading of the do nothing option, Effectively, at 56, the negatives of the present market state are investigated. So this is, if you like, capturing the problems being addressed. Legal ivory trade can increase the illicit trade in poaching because there is confusion whether antiques contain illegal ivory or not. So where is that? Paragraph 56A. <laughs> Banning trade will increase the stigma of buying ivory, reducing demand, in both the legal and the legal markets. It's not a risk-based analysis, it's a straightforward proposition. Also, those who buy ivories in the investment options will cease to do so if they have concerns as to whether they can find a market outlet for it. And then there is suggestive evidence that legal ivory is used by smugglers to mask the illicit ivory trade. See paragraph 30. And that's just a general reference back, when you go back to 30, to um, uh, a UN uh, document that is the centre point of uh, my learned friend's respondent's notice, which I'll come back to. And then over the page, benefits of ending the ivory trade in the UK, 293. Direct and indirect benefits are listed. The principal direct benefit is... UK citizens' welfare will be enhanced from the knowledge that the UK is playing its part to bring an end to the illegal trade in ivory. Strong reputational benefit to the UK. It will be easier to enforce domestically. There is no assessment of any beneficial impact for the numbers of elephants being poached or not poached. Nor does that appear in indirect benefits. Those are all about safari businesses, ecotourism, Preserving the biodiversity, um, elephant populations have a positive effect on ecosystems. Any reduction <coughs> in the illegal ivory trade will reduce pressure. So what one doesn't see is any evidence of some kind of risk-based approach. And we can't be certain that this is going to happen, but these are the effects that might ensue. And then what happens is that the RPC critique of this report, which is in the preceding tab, asks a number of searching questions, summarised by the judge in the judgment of paragraph 33. One of the topics are, as, as to the harm caused to those who own uh, antique ivory. We'll come back to that. But the one that is of relevance for the precautionary principle, that's at 275 through to 276, they, we're still looking at the, uh, the impact assessment. This is the RPC... Critique of the impact of the, the preceding tab, my lord. <coughs> Where they say the IA's assessment of benefits would benefit significantly from discussing in more detail the likely effectiveness of the proposal in reducing trade in new ivory in the light of previous experiences. In other words, they're asking very politely. How is this going to contribute to a reduction in the demand for fresh ivory? Sorry, which page are you on? 275 to 276, my lord. Tab 15. I have that. I can't find the quotation. It's right at the bottom, last paragraph, under the heading benefits. They set out the paragraphs I've just read, and then after the italics, the IA assessment of benefits would see benefits significantly, and then it goes over the page from discussing in more detail, etc. Two seven eight, which is the beginning of the next text. Yes, ma'am. The RPC opinion is there summarised as being green. What yes. What does that mean? It means it passes. And the judge was critical of the fact that it was described as green in circumstances where it had raised a number of seemingly quite important concerns, both on this front and in relation to the costs to individuals and businesses. Sometimes committee reports like this 
are as much concerned with requiring the government to be more explicit about benefits. It's, sometimes it's a substantive criticism, sometimes it's a drafted criticism. This was given fit for purpose. I was just looking at the provision you were referring to at the bottom of page 275. That's in relation to the, the, the UK wealth, citizen welfare being enhanced by knowledge the UK playing its part and reputational benefits. Is it, I mean, if it's in relation to that, that alone, that they're really referring to and criticising the authors of the IA for, it's not really about the causal connection with supply and demand, it's about reputational benefits. With respect, my lord, the, the way we read 275 to 276 is you've identified that the UK citizens are going to feel better about how this is going to contribute. Can you explain how, in fact, it's going to reduce trade in new ivory? Yes, it's discussed in detail the effectiveness. Yes. The likely effectiveness in reducing trade in new ivory. That's the very subject matter that you should be investigating if you're conducting a precautionary principle based risk assessment. understand that um, security to the main entrance, is that right? The main entrance won't be able to attend. Well, the main entrance won't be able to 9 o'clock, they can't gain access. But, but, but anybody who wants to attend can gain access to the West Green entrance. But they'll have to explain why they're going to be here. So if anybody wants to come along tomorrow at 9 o'clock, they can, but they will have to go through the West Green entrance and explain why they want to 